first of all, I want to thank uh, the organizers of the workshop because it's a great opportunity to be here and to meet uh, people from uh, this community because initially I, I did not uh, start on, on these issues. Uh, but uh, I got to work on that uh, when I was doing my postdoc at uh, Courant uh, with uh, Pierre Germain, who is part of uh, everything I will talk about. And there is also Joachim Ampatsoglu, who is also at uh, Courant. Okay. So my talk is going to be about uh, the derivation of uh, the kinetic uh, wave equation. And it arises as an effective equation from the, for example, from the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So uh, first of all, what are my equations and my data? I'm going to look at uh, two types of equation, in fact. So this equation, they will have some dispersion relation, which looks like the Laplacian dispersion relation. And then there's going to be some uh, nonlinear terms. So either I'm going to be in the cubic case, or I'm going to be in the quadratic case. So here, uh, there are several notations I need to explain. So first of all, I'm not always going to look at the usual Laplace notation, uh, Laplace dispersion relation. So uh, here, this in Fourier, it's u hat xi that is multiplied by omega of xi. And I have a parameter lambda that is tuned uh, to ensure what is called uh, the weakly nonlinear regime. And I have an additional notation, which is this uh, capital uh, M here. So in fact, Sometimes I will have some issues with my nonlinear effects at low frequencies. And OK, I will cheat a little bit. I will use M to dampen them. OK, so uh, now I've explained uh, all the notation in my equations. The thing is that I'm going to consider equation uh, data which are taken randomly. So u0 can be of uh, the following form. So I can have a of k e to the i x dot k. OK. Or I can have this type of initial data. Somehow getting us uh, with my notes. Uh, so uh, u0 of x is equal to epsilon to the d over 2 a of uh, x. And here I have v uh, over, OK, I will put it this way. Sorry. Um, with this normalization, v of epsilon dot x. OK, and here I have dw of um, 
Okay, so uh, basically these are uh, random Gaussian fields. Here it's if I'm working in the homogeneous case. So x lives in the torus. And here, if it's I'm working in the inhomogeneous case. So x is in Rd. So uh, I have several time scales for my equation. You can check that uh, u0 is roughly of size 1. So that my nonlinear effect, yeah. Uh, so the w there, does it have to do something with the w there? Or is it uh, going, I mean, there's a w in the u0? Uh, it's uh, omega. omega. Sorry. <laughs> so omega is my, is my dispersion relation. So this is a, a Wiener integral, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, okay. So, uh, uh, thank you for that. So, uh, I have some uh, particular time scales. So, since u0 is roughly of size 1, then I have a nonlinear time scale. Which is either uh, lambda uh, to the minus 2 uh, for the cubic case, or lambda to the minus one. This is the time at which uh, I can see some nonlinear effects. Like these terms, they start to produce something. And now you can see that uh, with this specific initial data, if I look at in Fourier, I have a Fourier spectrum which lives at scale uh, epsilon minus one, which takes small values. And my Fourier coefficients, basically, they are taken randomly. And uh, I have uh, some uh, specific envelope for them, which is given by A. So my linear effects, they are kicking in. Uh, OK, so I did not put yet a formula for omega, but omega, think of it as the Laplacian. So my linear effects, they are kicking in at time epsilon square. And so the weekly nonlinear regime that I wanted to ensure here basically requires a condition on epsilon and lambda so that my linear time scale is much smaller than my nonlinear time scale. And okay, so basically my nonlinear effects they accumulate, but they are filtered with the linear effects. And then I have some consolations that I can think happen because my data are chosen uh, randomly. So we expect that maybe at a statistical level only a certain information remains. And we want to study how this thing will evolve, the point energy spectrum. Which is, uh, so okay, uh, I'm sorry, I will use W even if W is uh, up there, but it's not the same W, yet uh, another one, I'm sorry. So W of K will be equal to this thing here. I take the average value of U hat epsilon K to the square. So this is if I'm working on the torus. And if I'm not working in the torus, then uh, I was uh, explained in the previous talk, I'm going to study uh, the Wigner transform of my solution. Defined this way.
Okay, and so uh, what you have to think, basically, if I do a, a little drawing, is that uh, if I'm in the inhomogeneous case, so okay, I will take uh, initially everything to be, say, compactly supported in space, even if I'm looking at uh, all RD. And so I have a function u, which oscillates very fast at scale epsilon, and its local Fourier spectrum near any point x is somehow well described by, for the initial data, this function a, and after that, um, by this Wigner transform uh, w, at least uh, in the modulus. Okay, and so there is a conjecture. So here, I'm going to put. So there is a conjecture which is that as epsilon goes to zero, so you have to think about it as being uh, with a large and larger uh, number of degrees of freedom, and you ensure that you are in the, non uh, the weakly nonlinear regime. Then W converges to rho, the solution to so here, if I'm in the homogeneous case, so if I'm working uh, on the torus, then I have dt rho which is equal to this expression. So here I'm not going to write down explicitly what C is, but this is some nonlinear cubic convolution. While if you are working, so this is for the torus, while if you are working on the whole space, then you expect to see this equation that I'm going to write in full details. So here, this convolution operator is given by the following formula. It's an integral where you have some restriction on some set which represents uh, Kirchhoff flows described in the previous talk. Then we have some resonance set and we have some quadratic term with gain and loss terms. And there is another part. Okay. So uh, I'm going to say what are these things right after, but the thing to notice is that if I'm working on the torus, then I should see 
something which departs from linear evolution. I mean, if I'm just solving uh, my linear equation, my Fourier spectrum, it does not move, right? The energy does not move. But here, it describes, OK, when you add nonlinear effects, even if they are very small, if you wait long enough, then you will see something. And this something will be described by this convolution operator. And if I'm on the whole space, so here, this is for x in Rd, then my wave packets, they start to move, and they move uh, with uh, my uh, expected uh, speed. OK. So this resonance set here are given with the following formulas. And when I put uh, row 1 or row 2, uh, this means that I evaluate row uh, at different variables. Uh, so here I had an integral over v1, v2. Here I have dv1, dv2. Okay. Uh, okay, so the fact that there exists an effective uh, equation which describes my system statistically, uh, it has a long history. So there is uh, some very early work by Pyers, 29, then by Hasselman in 63. And uh, already, like, the physical systems are not the same. Like, this is more uh, quantum dynamics and this is uh, uh, weather waves. So this kinetic uh, framework, it has uh, a wide range of uh, applicability somehow. So it can be, uh, uh, we can find it in different uh, situations. And the theory has been revived by uh, Zaharov uh, exactly to fit uh, the diversity of all the possible framework could be used in. And so you have a famous book by Zaharov, Elvov and Falkovich, famous book by Nazar and Co as well. Etc. Yeah. Can you say what you mean by that it converges to this equation when epsilon goes to zero because you still have a factor of one over epsilon? Um, okay, so it converges. Uh, it depends uh, on, on the time scale, right? Uh, yeah, but if epsilon tends to zero, this equation, so everything will go to infinity because. Uh, so everything will go to infinity, but uh, I can still expect to have... Uh, okay, it's just that I didn't want to renormalize my time for rho because I have two time scales. So of course, uh, thank you for this remark. So here, this equation is uh, not really defined at the, uh, at the limit, right? Yeah. And so the idea is that I have two time scales. I have epsilon, which is the time I have to wait to see my wave packets to move. Yeah. And I have my kinetic time, which is the time I have to wait to see nonlinear effects. And in fact, different things can happen. Maybe my wave packets, they move way faster than the kinetic time, in which case uh, somehow this term I should not see any effect. Or maybe it's the opposite. Maybe my kinetic time, it happens way before the time needed for my wave packets to start to move. And so this is interesting when both times are equal when the kinetic time is equal to my time epsilon, in which case I can define a renormalized time. And I just renormalize the time for this row here to be the time uh, being my kinetic time. And so what I'm just saying is that maybe this solution, it only lives on a very short interval of time. But still, I can define it for any epsilon on this short interval of time. And maybe on this short interval of time, it's true that they agree to leading order. So this means that it's not really a limit. This is just the yeah, assumption to be here as epsilon goes to zero. Uh, yeah. Well, unless maybe uh, it could happen that rho does not depend on x. Yeah. In which case, you derive um, you know, homogeneous, homogeneous equation. equation. Yeah. yeah. 
I, I just meant to say that it may happen that for some reason rho does not depend on x in some limit, in which case you derive a space homogeneous equation. Uh, okay, it, it may be the case, but uh, this is not the, the thing I, I'm looking at. No, really the, the thing uh, I'm thinking here is more of, okay, it's maybe the wording is not maybe correct, but what I want to say is that this equation you can at least solve it for a short time. Mm -hmm. And you can compare this and W. And maybe they are close one to another, even if the uh, typical time for which you have a solution to this is like going to zero as epsilon goes to zero. So maybe if you want converges, I should say uh, is close. If you want, is it better? Yeah, because this, this yes. still depends on epsilon. That, yes. That's just my point. So yeah, OK. So the convergence is, uh, I mean, I wanted to, uh, there will be a CRM after with uh, precise things. And here I just wanted to do something a bit informal. So W is close to. OK, so I'll put this uh, this way. Uh, OK, so why is this true? So you see, we, we start with uh, the nonlinear Schrodinger equation. And at the end, we arrive uh, to some equation, which is more of a kinetic type. What are the ingredients responsible for that? So basically, we have seen them uh, in the previous talk. And I will just uh, quickly review them. So the first thing is that I repeat it, uh, nonlinear effects, they accumulate, but they are filtered by linear effects. And uh, only particular interactions, they will appear uh, statistically. So what you have is that you can use VIX rule, as was used in the previous talk. In that, when you have some nonlinear products and you go to the average value, and if, for example, these are Gaussians, then this is the same thing as computing all pairwise products. And this can be represented graphically in the sense that here, maybe this is the formula that explains uh, the diagrams that were made before, that when I do that, I'm saying that if I want to compute this product of four Gaussians, I need to look only at three configurations. I can draw my Gaussians as dots. And so the first configuration I put them two by two this way. Second configuration, I put the first one with the third one and the second one with the fourth one. And my last configuration, I put the first one with the fourth one and the second one with the third one. Okay. So uh, this is at the same time some things that uh, should tell you that only certain particular interactions will remain. But at the same time, that uh, there is a way to compute them. Okay, it's something you can use to compute actually. Then uh, I didn't. I, I was afraid of introducing uh, Feynman diagrams, but hopefully uh, there was this lecture just before, so maybe uh, uh, you you will be able to understand that if you've never seen that before. That the iteration of Duhamel formula should converge on a larger scale. And really, I mean, the idea that we use the Duhamel formula is because since to the, the linear effects, they act at a time scale which is much shorter than the nonlinear effects, nonlinear effects, they 
are somehow a bit destroyed by the linear effects. And you really need to understand the linear filtering, which is well understood uh, by Duhamel formula. So once you start to do that, you want to expand your solution to write it as the linear evolution of your initial data, then the nonlinear correction induced by that first piece, So for example, here I'm just going to write for my quadratic equation. And higher order terms. This I can represent as Feynman diagrams. So my linear evolution, I just put um, a line. Then here, I have already four terms, depending on uh, whether I was taking the complex conjugate or not. So here, I can draw it this way. So if I don't take any complex conjugate, I put this like this. Then maybe when I develop this product, I have some complex conjugation showing up. And so on. Okay. Um, where is the thing? I think under the table. Under the table. Oh, no. On your paper. Oh. No. Uh, ah, okay. It wasn't the thing to erase. It's the thing to go and catch the one. Oh. Okay. You see that? Oh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'll do that after. Thank you. I'll just put it here. Okay. So. I can give a formula for this specific guy. It would be similar to the formula we've seen in the last talk. So this guy here is equal to this. So, of course, since I have a nonlinear product, in Fourier, it's transformed into a convolution. Then I have some oscillatory integral showing up due to the nonlinear interaction and the linear evolution. And I have my initial data. Here, this quantity, I can compute it. And this integral is equal to this. And so when I have this oscillatory integral, there can be two cases. Either omega is very small, so if omega is smaller than 1 over t, then this is of size t, which is some growth. Or if this is uh, the opposite way, this is of size 1 over omega. which in the end will give lower order terms. So this is what I, I repeat it uh, again. I have my linear effects which act on a time scale which is much shorter. So in this filtering, the nonlinear effects, they will be mostly located in the resonance set, which is where I have my growth. And I see that if I want to have my growth, omega must be close to zero, right? And so this is why there is this thing here. At the limit, I only see the resonant configurations. Uh, OK. So uh, I hope that I gave a few ideas. So 
maybe I, I sum up. So there is a way to understand products of uh, Gaussians, and in the end, you can understand when you go to multilinear expansion uh, how one can talk to another. There is a way you can do computations using a diagrammatic expansion, and when you do so, you end up with oscillatory integrals which will locate your nonlinear effects close to the resonance set. And we have several results on the validity of the kinetic wave equation. So this ends my first part. My second part is going to be devoted to the results. So first, I'm going to talk about the cubic homogeneous case. And uh, the first uh, idea is, OK, before I can try to prove whether or not my kinetic wave equation will describe my Fourier spectrum, is it true that my solution will at least live on the time scale of my uh, kinetic wave equation? So I can do some drawing like that. Here, I will put the nonlinear effect. So the further I'm on the right, the smaller lambda is. So nonlinear effects are really small. And so here homogeneous, I really recall, and this will be very important. This is Todi. And here I put in an epsilon log basis the time that I want to reach. So I want to have a solution up to time t. So all the theorems I'm going to talk about are of the form. So here I'm just going to talk about the part of the theorem, which is there exists a solution of to up to time t. And on a suitable set of initial data. Um, so we had a first result with Pierre. in 2019, we could reach these timescales. So there are particular timescales. Here, if I reach this time, I, I need to go up. Okay. The, long, the more I go up, the longer my solution lives. So the linear timescale, of course, my solution, I know it exists up to this time. After that, I have the nonlinear timescale. But at the nonlinear time scale, even if nonlinear effects did kick in, I did not reach my kinetic time yet. So my kinetic time is actually farther. And I have some other time that maybe I will have some time to think about, to talk about, which is the time I see only the fully resonant configurations because I'm working on the torus. So okay. Basically, this is a time at which you see really that you are not in the inhomogeneous case, but that you are on the torus. And you see that if you only take the Laplacian dispersion relation, basically in Fourier, omega can only take integer values. And the kinetic time is the one you want to reach. So with Pierre, we were able to uh, do this. We could not actually reach the kinetic time at this point, but we were arbitrarily close. OK, this is a very special configuration where the kinetic time is equal to 1. OK, then independently, there was a work by Deng and Hani. And they were able, uh, basically, to make the solution live uh, up to the fully non-resonant time. And here, there is really something happening when the kinetic time is 1, is that 
you see they can, here it's discontinuous, right? So they were able to almost reach the kinetic time equal to 1, uh, but they could not, neither. And uh, then this was for the usual Laplacian. So with Pierre, we said, OK, m maybe there is something to do if we take another dispersion relation. So in 20, we took this dispersion relation. So it's a self-adjoint matrix close to the identity. And H in a full Lebeg, uh, in a set of full measure. So basically now if I start to play a little bit with my dispersion relation, uh, we were able to obtain something like that. So we were able to almost reach the kinetic time and always for times which are greater, I mean, in configurations where the kinetic time is uh, greater than one. And finally, uh, this year, uh, in a very impressive work, Deng and Annie, uh, they were able to reach the kinetic time. So they were able to prove that this equation uh, okay, so the kinetic time is equal to 1, though, so there is not the problem that uh, Laure mentioned, because this is 1, this term is not here because I'm in the homogeneous case, so the limit uh, <laughs> is <laughs> well defined and actually you have convergence. Uh, okay. So, now my talk wanted to focus mainly on the... Uh, sorry, yeah. the, the last result is for which dispersion relation? Ah, thank you very much. This is for diagonal dispersion relation. So again, they have to play a little bit with the dispersion relation. So this is HI psi i square. So here, of course, I have a minus in front. And again, with h uh, in a set of full Lebesgue measure. OK. And so, in the in inhomogeneous case, uh, here I'm going to write down uh, a statement. So this is joint work with Ampato glue Germain and is that if you work in dimension greater than two, I had my initial data which was described with this function A and I take it OK, this is an overkill, but I take it, uh, say, uh, compactly supported, uh, say, infinity. Then there exists kappa um, 
I mean, I take this and kappa greater than zero. So there exists epsilon star and kappa prime such that for epsilon small enough, I can make my solution live up to this time. So you see, I cannot reach the kinetic time. I miss it by some uh, arbitrarily small uh, polynomial loss. So there exists this, and there exists E, a set of probability which is almost one. On which there exists a unique solution on my interval 0 t. And for any t in this interval, I have convergence in uh, an infinity L1 in this sense. So I take the Wiener transform. There was some uh, expectancy that I needed to take, some average. But I don't know maybe outside E that I have a solution. So I restrict my uh, average to the set E. This is why what W uh, E denotes. So the Wigner transform of U, if I compare it with the solution to my uh, kinetic equation, which lives also up to this time capital T, then this is smaller than this. So basically, uh, it's not really the derivation of the kinetic wave equation. What it is saying is that somehow, if I do only the Taylor expansion of my kinetic wave equation, then it will agree with my Wigner transform. In the sense that the error that I generate, I have some epsilon to the kappa prime here, so the error will be of smaller order. So it's not justifying the kinetic wave equation, it's rather justifying the onset of the kinetic wave equation. Okay. I, I'm sorry, I'm a bit lost in this, all the scalings. Yeah. So lambda was supposed to be small because this, this measured the size of the nonlinearity, right? Oh, so I did not put anything uh, regarding lambda. So of course, uh, here I need to say that uh, lambda is much smaller than uh, epsilon minus 2. So if, ah, so it's not very small, actually. Uh, yes, but the thing is that uh, my linear effects, they act on a time scale which is so small with my real normalization, they act at time scale epsilon square. So if you want the linear effects, they are so strong that I can allow lambda to be, you know, lambda is small, in comparison with Okay, so epsilon. maybe I can uh, rephrase my question in a mm -hmm. way. Why, why do you need two parameters? Um, because essentially my impression here is that uh, what is important is this ratio between lambda and epsilon. Or something like this. But uh, then, then else, if this minimum uh, will be in general, <coughs> it will be just epsilon. <coughs> and so you will not see this uh, kinetic time. Yeah, but the, the problem that I have is that uh, I have a, somehow a third parameter, which is the size of my domain initially. So here I'm fixing A uh, with compact support. So if you want, uh, 
my initial data, it will be con supported in a domain of size 1, oscillating at scale epsilon. So if I wanted somehow to renormalize so that I put epsilon equal to 1, and then I see what just I have a new lambda, the problem is that I would make the size of my uh, data, I mean of the domain, go to infinity. So somehow uh, I have three parameters. I have the size of my domain, I have the size of my, I mean size of the uh, special scale of the envelope, special scale of the oscillations, and strength of the nonlinearity. So I can always renormalize to kill one of these parameters, but I still have two. Uh, yeah. So if you put everything on the initial data, you just have uh, oscillation and temp amplitude of the data, right? Yes. So I could also put lambda equal one, and then I would only have uh, yes, as you said. Yeah. You can say there are two parameters, the amplitude of the initial data and the mm -hmm. uh, oscillation. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, I mean, the, this was the way I was actually writing my nonlinear Schrodinger equation from the start. It's like you start from the usual Schrodinger equation, then you just say that your solution u is lambda times v, where v is of size 1, and then you end up with that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Okay, so uh, I've just uh, 10 minutes, which is a bit short to try yeah, but to... But excuse me, in your yeah. analysis, in some sense, maybe uh, there is right, always lambda, we can think it as a power of epsilon, right? Or, or not? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, in the analysis, we can always think that lambda is some power of epsilon. Yes, and some power uh, not... Uh, and then more the second negative parameter will be somehow which power we take, which is not exactly a small parameter, but yeah. somehow uh, one small parameter and one power, which is not small. But yeah. which, is which is exactly the picture <laughs> I was putting here, is that I have epsilon here. When I put log epsilon of lambda, it's exactly the power. Like <laughs> this means lambda is equal to epsilon to so the power. One small this parameter thing. and one power. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Okay, and so uh, in order to prove this theorem, maybe, I mean, uh, if you remember uh, last talk, there was uh, this uh, unitary estimate. Since uh, uh, Manfred was dealing with a linear equation, you knew that uh, somehow you could propagate a bound of size 1. Here, uh, we, I mean, we, we did not see any such type of things you could use. Like either the, the energy was not helpful, the conservation of the mass was not helpful. So in fact, uh, you really struggle in uh, actually proving bound on your remainder. So the idea is to start the same way. So you do some series expansion. Where your first piece is just your linear evolution, and then you solve iteratively these equations. So if I define my first n minus 1 iterates, my nes will take into account all interactions which are uh, with an interaction history of size uh, n minus 1. And at initial time, this is 0. So somehow, un, I can represent it as a graph of depth n. And so uh, I do not put uh, references here, thanks to the talk uh, of uh, Manfred uh, earlier. This uh, type of uh, expansion has been widely used. And of course, uh, we were uh, inspired by the work of uh, Spohn, Erdos-Yau, Erdos-Salmofer-Yau, 
and uh, also Lukarinen and Spohn, which actually uh, proved this uh, result uh, for NLS, but uh, in the context uh, of a statistical equilibrium. And here we are not at equilibrium. And now you want to decompose your solution U as an approximate part plus an error. And your approximate part, it's this series that you truncate at some large n. Then you want to show bounds on the error. And the philosophy is that uh, basically each time you iterate your duml formula, so the further you go with n large, then your solution should be better and better. So this type of ideas, it actually goes back to the work uh, of Bourguin. It was used uh, by Burke and Zetkoff uh, as well. And uh, it was used also in a work that I should mention by Buckmaster, Germain, Annie and Chata, which appeared uh, just before uh, our work uh, with uh, Pierre and that uh, we actually uh, improved the result there. And so the idea is that you want to control UR, which will solve this type of equation. So you have some linear terms. You have some bilinear terms. And finally, you have some error, which has been generated by your approximate solution. So first, you need to know the size of your error. Is it small? Is it big? And the thing is that your error is made of explicit terms for which you can do diagrammatic computations. So you can bound your error in actually uh, any uh, space that you would like, Lebesgue, Bourguin, Sobolev, whatever. So to bound the error term, we use <laughs> diagrammatic expansions And basically just, uh, I think, OK, I don't want to end uh, after uh, the time because some of you might be a bit tired. Just I, I wanted to, to say what are the novelties uh, when we deal with the inhomogeneous case. So uh, for example, here, uh, you want to bond EN. And so your error, it's made of these bricks over there, which are uh, my UN. So my error, actually, it will be 1 un, which has some interaction history. So this is un, interacting with some uk here. And you want to know whether that diagram actually in average, represents a function that is small or not. So what you do is that you put the same diagram on the right. So here, uh, this is this, but with a bar, say. So to simplify my discussion, I will just compute, for example, the L2 norm of un. So I put un bar here, un here, put them in Fourier. 
Then I make a convolution so that my output frequency here is zero. And this is a diagram which is similar to the one that Manfred mentioned, in that here, each time I have one line, it's a linear evolution, so I have to imagine that it comes with some oscillatory factor. Each time I put a vertex, then I have some nonlinear interaction which uh, with some resonance moduli uh, omegas. And each time I do an expectation, then I need to pair all my initial vertices. And these here are the interactions. And so, uh, okay, so here I need to put some more. So the main novelty is that uh, when you work on the homogeneous case, when you pair, you must require that the frequency here is equal to the frequency here. Here it's not anymore the case. So you have some slow variables showing up. Which are ground to of one. And an additional uh, novelty is that uh, each vertex comes with some time s. So you have several times. But they do not add to the whole time t. In fact, you have some more complex time constraints. Basically, here, for example, my time s4, it has to be greater than s3. However, s3 can be greater than s2, or s2 can be greater than s3. So uh, we use the exact same idea uh, that Manfred mentioned, is that uh, you have this uh, resolvent estimate, which actually uh, made uh, an alpha variable appear. But here, we have one alpha variable per time constraint that I see in my graph. So in fact, uh, we needed to do some refined uh, analysis of the residues and to introduce uh, many of these alphas. And so after that, you have to estimate the size of your oscillatory integrals, but bearing in mind that you have some structure for the time constraints in your graph. And in particular, uh, there was just one problem. <coughs> is that these vertices, where you have this type of configurations and similar, If I have an output frequency which is xi, and when xi is small, so it's say much smaller than the expected size which is epsilon minus one, give bad bounds. So you cannot estimate them separately, and so the idea that we had is that we put them into clusters. So Uh, we decompose the graph with clusters in which basically what we prove is that once you have understood this uh, time constraint function here, if you put a bad vertex, for example, here, then this one here is okay. So you can have such kind of configurations where you have OK, bad, and OK. You can have a configuration in which both of them below are bad. But actually, the one on top can never be bad itself. So with this thing, what I'm saying roughly is that we partition the graph. The, cl the clusters, they have empty intersection. So each time we encounter a vertex which is, say, normal. We have some estimates that we can do, which actually pull out a t over taken to the uh, one-half factor. 
And each time we encounter one vertex which is in these bad clusters, then we have to do something else. But in the end, uh, we lose something here, blah, blah, blah. We continue our estimate, but when we reach this point here, actually, we regain something. And uh, this type of analysis actually is uh, what you want to do if you want to reach uh, the kinetic time scale, which is something we could uh, unfortunately uh, not do since we missed the kinetic time scale by some arbitrary small polynomial error. So, uh, okay, maybe. Uh, I will just sum up with one minute. I think that maybe something that we added to the previous work uh, dealing with a linear equation was how to deal with the error term and how to close the nonlinear analysis. Uh, so okay, after that, we have some computations to show the validity of the kinetic wave equation, but this is like standard. And if you want to go really in the details and to derive the full kinetic wave equation, uh, then basically you have to do uh, what was done uh, by uh, Manfred and his collaborators is that you analyze all possible graphs and you identify them either as leading, in which case they will lead to the kinetic wave equation or contribute in the limit, or as subleading, but there are so many subleading graphs that you have to prove very particular estimates for them. And this is what uh, Deng and Hani have done. And they could only do it for the case when the kinetic time is equal to 1. So I guess that uh, right now everybody is like hoping that this analysis can be carried on for quadratic problem on the whole space, for a wider range of dispersion relations, uh, and so on. Uh, I thank you for your attention. Excuse me. So uh, we have very complicated analysis, and I would like to ask whether you have some global information in your analysis, like co using conservation law or invariant measure consideration. Of. I mean, in all this analysis, it looks to be very evolved, but mainly local analysis. We don't have global information. No, uh, we don't use uh, global information. Like conservation law or... Uh, we don't. I mean, somehow it's... Uh, I mean, if I can phrase it this way, th this type of conservation law, they, they live at a regularity level, which actually does not allow you to close anything. Uh, yeah. So randomness is used only in local type of analysis. It's not used in a more global way. No. No, we don't. And I have a second, sorry, a second question. Course. Yesterday, Lord gave a talk, uh, a course on the derivation of Boltzmann equation, and it was very un very clear that she defined a uh, empirical measure from some uh, particles, and then she said that this empirical, uh, that some uh, like law of large numbers, something, some average of this uh, type of measure converged to Boltzmann equation. Can we interpret your result like this? For instance, you take the particles to be the Fourier coefficients, and then you define some empirical measure, right? Empirical measure, and then, I mean, just a question of language, because I have the impression to see two talks say more or less the same philosophical thing, but the formalism is all <laughs> different. So can we define suitable empirical? Like in your lecture yesterday, just yeah. write the things in this way for this result. Is it possible, or? Actually, physicists write with the empirical measure. Sorry? Physicists, they, they write all this with some precon measure in the Fourier space. So you can re rewrite all these theorems yeah. like in your lecture yesterday? I think so. Okay. You missed the lecture, so. Yeah, I missed the lecture. But not because of me, it's because of Ariarbi. I'm sorry about that. More natural <laughs> question would be to see what happens with the real linear Boltzmann um, Schrodinger equation with a given potential in the low density, in the um, weak coupling limit for which you expect the uh, genuine Boltzmann equation. Up to now, I, I don't think that there is uh, any kind of result, up, even for short time. I mean, mm -hmm. what I mean. <laughs> if you compare with the classical case, uh, uh, any kind of scaling limit, the, the more national problem is to look at what happens for the quantum analog of the classical case. Mm -hmm. So this means that you have to start with the linear Boltzmann, the, the linear Schrodinger equation of the given potential, mm -hmm. apply the weak coupling uh, 
uh, scaling and see what happens. And this is, I, I don't think that uh, there is a. This will be your particles, right? Your... Oh, real particles, yes. Yeah. I just want to go back to this. I'm sorry uh, uh, about the scaling, but so in, in the case by Deng and Annie, mm -hmm. what I understand actually from their scaling is that actually the size of their box is much smaller than the, 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 the mean free pass, meaning that actually you have a mechanism which is not exactly the uh, interaction of waves, but the interaction of some kind of waves, but which are already uh, mixed. And in your case, my impression is that, so you, you wrote the equation yeah. with this transport, which is actually much faster than the collision. Yeah. And so in the whole space, if you have this dispersion, which is quite fast, and your collision operator, which is local, then I would expect that you have almost no interaction. If, if I start with a couple of uh, wave packets, they just go to infinity in a, in, uh, say very fast, then I, I don't understand how we can have a lot of interactions. So uh, I, I would say the following is that uh, here our result shows that in the case where we are not in, uh, in the configuration you mentioned, the so in the case where actually the kinetic time scale is shorter than this escape time. So when the waves, they, they stay constrained. So they interact, and then you see this uh, kinetic wave equation. You could argue that Deng and Hani, what they do, is that they work on the box, and they make the time scale to be so big that actually the waves, they travel, they travel wrong. Yeah, so you have and the so this mechanism before you have the interactions. Yes. But here, this is the opposite. Somehow, somehow you have this, 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 this transport, which is also much faster. And so somehow, all the waves should go to infinity before they interact. Uh, but because your kinetic time is typically of the order of one. So say, to derive a kinetic equation, for me, the kinetic time should be of the order of one. Mm -hmm. OK? And then you have one over epsilon, which is, which is uh, much bigger. And so transport is somehow is penalized. So if you are in the whole space, if you have a very fast transport, then mm -hmm. all the waves will go to infinity before they... So you will have a couple of interactions, but very few of them, actually. But uh, actually, uh, what Deng and Hani, uh, what they conjecture, is that uh, their results should also hold true for smaller kinetic time. So for regimes in which actually the kinetic time is smaller, so that their waves, they don't travel a lot. Yeah. They also expect their uh, kinetic wave equation to be uh, in the limit. So I cannot enter in the details, but actually when you do these uh, diagrammatic expansions, you have uh, enemies. So these enemies with PR, we call them the belt diagrams. And uh, Deng and Hani, they call them the irregular chains. And uh, I mean, when we did we our work with uh, Pierre, the second work, we actually proved that uh, certain diagrams have very bad size. And they, they are leading in some sense. But actually, what uh, Deng and Hani showed after that is that you have some constellation which shows up. So here I know what I'm talking about is just very technical. But uh, th that is to say that uh, Deng and Hani, they really think that their result should be valid for kinetic times which are uh, shorter. And uh, the way that I, interpreted that I interpret this is that uh, I mean, you, you don't need this uh, ergodicity thing, uh, I believe. I don't say uh, that you need yeah. it. I just say that um, at, at this stage, of course, technically it's very complicated. So it's very complicated to understand what are the, the, the physical mechanism. But, but say, just writing the limiting equation, I'm not so sure that we are really describing what we would like to describe. Okay, that is, that is 
question. <laughs> I don't even know mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> no, but uh, I'll think about it. But uh, really, um, th there's no contradiction in the end. Like they really, th this is my feeling: is that uh, um, somehow you 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 don't need to. You just need to to wait long enough so that actually your uh, linear waves they they interact. But whether or not they have to wrap around the torus or they have to interact for a long time, it's just it's en encoded just in this uh, kinetic time scale. And it's actually not um, necessarily to have like some reference between this uh, oscillation size and the size of your box. No, I don't think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I guess then we end the questions here. So Today we are, we are done, <laughs> <laughs> and tomorrow morning we will start again at 9 uh, with Law's lecture. Thank you, and it's... Thank you.